This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 12 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash k w a m e g e n o v v. The Shop. Section 1. I stand in line with a dozen prisoners in the anteroom of the deputy's office. Humiliation overcomes me as my eye falls, for the first time in the full light of day, upon my striped clothes. I am degraded to a beast. My first impression of a prisoner in stripes is painfully vivid. He resembled a dangerous brute. Somehow, the idea is associated in my mind with a wild tigress, and I, too, must now look like that. The door of the rotunda swings open, admitting the tall, lank figure of the deputy warden. Hands up! The deputy slowly passes along the line, examining a hand here and there. He separates the men into groups. Then, pointing to the one in which I am included, he says in his feminine accents, None crippled. Officers, take them, hm hm, to number seven. Turn them over to Mr. Hood's. Fall in. Forward. March. My resentment at the cattle-like treatment is merged into eager expectation. At last I am assigned to work. I speculate on the character of number seven, and on the possibilities of escape from there. Flanked by guards, we cross the prison yard in close lockstep. The centennials on the wall, their rifles resting loosely on crooked arm, face the striped line winding snake-like through the open space. The yard is spacious and clean, the lawn well kept and inviting. The first breath of fresh air in two weeks violently stimulates my longing for liberty. Perhaps the shop will offer an opportunity to escape. The thought quickens my observation. Bounded north, east, and south by the stone wall, the two blocks of the cell house form a parallelogram, enclosing the shops, kitchen, hospital, and, on the extreme south, the women's quarters. Break ranks. We enter number seven, a mat shop. With difficulty, I distinguish the objects in the dark, low-ceilinged room, with its small barred windows. The air is heavy with dust. The rattling of the looms is deafening. An atmosphere of noisy gloom pervades the place. The officer in charge assigns me to a machine occupied by a lanky prisoner in stripes. Jim, show him what to do. Considerable time passes without Jim taking the least notice of me. Bent low over the machine, he seems absorbed in the work, his hands deftly manipulating the shuttle, his foot on the treadle. Presently, he whispers, hoarsely, Fresh fish? What did you say? You bloke, long here? Mm, two weeks. Watch you doing? Twenty-one years. Quit your kidding. It's true. Honest? Holy gee! The shuttle flies to and fro. Jim is silent for a while, then he demands, abruptly, What they put you here for? I don't know. Been kicking? No. Dan use the bugs? Why so? This here is crank shop. They never put a mug here except these bugs, or else they got it in for you. How do you happen to be here? Me? The goddamn bitch got it in for me. See this? He points to a deep gash over his temple. Had a scap with the screws. Almost knocked me glimmer out. It was that big bull there, Pete Hoods. I'll get even with him, all right. Damn his rotten soul. I'll kill him. By God, I will. I'll croak here anyhow. Perhaps it isn't so bad, I tried to encourage him. It ain't, eh? What do you know about it? I've got the combat, splitting blood every night. This does killin' me. Kill you too, damn quick. As if to emphasize his words, he is seized with a fit of coughing, prolonged and hollow. The shuttle has, in the meantime, become entangled in the fringes of the matting. Recovering his breath, Jim snatches the knife at his side, and with a few deft strokes releases the metal. To and fro flies the gleaming thing, and Jim is again absorbed in his task. Don't bother me no more, he warns me. I'm behind with me work. Every muscle tense, his long body almost stretched across the loom, in turn pulling and pushing, Jim bends every effort to hasten the completion of the day's task. The guard approaches. How's he doing? he inquires, indicating me with a nod of the head. 
He's alright, but say, Hoods, this year is no place for the kid. He's got a 21 spot. Shut your damn trap, the officer retorts angrily. The consumptive bends over his work, fearfully eyeing the keeper's measuring stick. As the officer turns away, Jim pleads, Mr. Hoods, I'd lose time teach him. Won't you please take off a bit? De task is more than I can do, and I'm sick. Nonsense. There's nothing the matter with you, Jim. You're just lazy. That's what you are. Don't be shamming now. It don't go with me. At noon, the overseer calls me aside. You're green here, he warns me. Pay no attention to Jim. He wanted to be bad, but we showed him different. He's all right now. You have a long time. See that you behave yourself. This is no playhouse, you understand? As I am about to resume my place in the line, forming to march back to the cells for dinner, he recalls me. Say, Alec, you'd better keep an eye on that fellow Jim. He is a little off, you know. He points toward my head with his significant rotary motion. Section 2 The mat shop is beginning to affect my health. The dust has inflamed my throat, and my eyesight is weakening in the constant dusk. The officer in charge has repeatedly expressed dissatisfaction with my slow progress in the work. I'll give you another chance, he cautioned me yesterday, and if you don't make a good map by next week, down in the hole you go. He severely upbraided Jim for his inefficiency as instructor. As the consumptive was about to reply, he suffered an attack of coughing. The emaciated face turned greenish-yellow, but in a moment he seemed to recover and continued working. Suddenly, I saw him clutch at the frame. A look of terror spread over his face. He began panting for breath, and then a stream of dark blood gushed from his mouth, and Jim fell to the floor. The steady whir of the looms continued. The prisoner at the neighboring machine cast a furtive look at the prostrate form, and bent lower over his work. Jim lay motionless, the blood dyeing the floor purple. I rushed to the officer. Mr. Hoods, Jim has... Back to your place, damn you, he shouted at me. How dare you leave it without permission? I just... Get back, I tell you, he roared, raising the heavy stick. I returned to my place. Jim lay very still, his lips parted, his face ashen. Slowly, with measured step, the officer approached. What's the matter here? I pointed at Jim. The guard glanced at the unconscious man, then lightly touched the bleeding face with his foot. Get up, Jim, get up! The nerveless head rolled to the side, striking the leg of the loom. Guess he isn't shamming, the officer muttered. Then he shook his finger at me, menacingly. Don't you ever leave your place without orders. Remember you! After a long delay, causing me to fear that Jim had been forgotten, the doctor arrived. It was Mr. Rankin, the senior prison physician, a short, stocky man of advanced middle age, with a humorous twinkle in his eye. He ordered the sick prisoner taken to the hospital. Did anyone see the man fall? he inquired. This man did, the keeper replied, indicating me. While I was explaining, the doctor eyed me curiously. Presently, he asked my name. Oh, the celebrated case, he smiled. I know Mr. Frick quite well. Not such a bad man at all. But you'll be treated well here, Mr. Berkman. This is a democratic institution, you know. By the way, what is the matter with your eyes? They are inflamed. Always that way. Only since I am working in this shop. Ah, uh, he is all right, doctor, the officer interposed. He's only been here a week. Mr. Rankin cast a quizzical look at the guard. You want him here? Why, E. S. were short of men. Well, I am the doctor, Mr. Hoods. Then, turning to me, he added, Report in the morning on the sick list. Section 3 The doctor's examination has resulted in my removal to the hosiery department. The changes filled me with renewed hope. A disciplinary shop, to which are generally assigned the hard cases, inmates in the first stages of mental derangement or exceptionally unruly prisoners. The mat shop is the point of special supervision in severest discipline. It is the best guarded shop, from which escape is impossible. But in the hosiery department, a recent addition to the local industries, I may find the right opportunity. It will require time, of course, but my patience shall be equal to the great object. The working conditions, also, are more favorable. The room is light and airy, the discipline not so stringent. My nearsightedness has secured for me immunity from machine work. 
the deputy at first insisted that my eyes were good enough to see the numerous needles of the hosiery machine it is true i could see them but not with sufficient distinctness to ensure the proper insertion of the initial threads to admit partial ability would result i knew in being ordered to produce the task and failure or faulty work would be severely punished necessity drove me to subterfuge i pretended total inability to distinguish the needles repeated threats of punishment failing to change my determination i have been assigned to the comparatively easy work of turning the stockings the occupation though tedious is not exacting it consists in gathering the hosiery manufactured by the knitting machines whence the product issues without soles i carry the pile to the table provided with an iron post about eighteen inches high topped with a small inverted disc on this instrument the stockings are turned inside out by slipping the article over the post then quickly undressing it the hosiery thus turned is forwarded to the looping machines by which the product is finished and sent back to me once more to be turned preparatory to sorting and shipment monotonously the days and weeks pass by practice lends me great dexterity in the work but the hours of drudgery drag with heavy heel i seek to hasten time by forcing myself to take an interest in the task i count the stockings i turn the motions required by each operation and the amount accomplished within a given time but in spite of these efforts my mind persistently reverts to unprofitable subjects my friends and the propaganda the terrible injustice of my excessive sentence suicide and escape my nights are restless oppressed with a nameless weight or tormented by dread i awake with a start breathless and affrighted to experience the momentary relief of danger past but the next instant i am overwhelmed by the consciousness of my surroundings and plunged into rage and despair powerless hopeless thus day succeeds night and night succeeds day in the ceaseless struggle of hope and discouragement of life and death amid the externally placid tenor of my pennsylvania nightmare End of section 12。This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.